Good morning, uh, Dale Keller here. I'm uh, Bureau Director for the Salt Lake County Environmental Health uh, Division, a, a component of the Salt Lake County Health Department. And for all intents and purposes for this presentation, I'm our agency's uh, nuisance abatement coordinator. Uh, that's a position that I assumed, I guess, two or three months ago because I had some pretty compelling concerns about the importance of, of civility and partnering as far as doing enforcement of uh, abatement of illicit encampments in Salt Lake County. As a part of this presentation, the majority of it is going to be a slide presentation with a number of uh, videos embedded within the slides. I'm probably going to overwhelm you with pictures of garbage and trash and environmental degradation, but quite frankly, that's kind of the point of the presentation. Also, just to give you a feel for who I am or who we are as environmental health, uh, we are the enforcement arm of the Salt Lake County Health Department. The uh, stereotypical uh, component of what we do is um, pretty obvious. People think of restaurant inspections, which we certainly do seven or 8,000 of those per year, but we also have many, many other modalities or functions. Uh, I think I looked online and saw 64 or 65. Uh, those would include things like solid waste uh, cases, housing cases, uh, personal service uh, facilities such as cosmetology, tanning, massage, body art. We inspect every correctional facility in every school, um, the IM program, hazmat events, just to name a few. And so included with that, um, or those responsibilities is the oversight of, uh, of illicit encampments, which we have a pretty substantial problem in Salt Lake County. Uh, it's really important that, uh, that you understand that I totally get that there are many, many variables with um, illicit encampments and our unsheltered friends in, in, in the community. Uh, things like um, Resource resistant, just want to be left alone. Uh, drug addiction, mental health issues, economic issues. Many times as you talk to our unsheltered friends or some event in their life, uh, a crisis such as a divorce, a death in a family, a job loss, something like that, a very tight housing market. And there are a lot of variables, but for environmental health, we focus on two pieces of this issue. The public health component of it which is substantial and the environmental degradation, which uh, obviously is a pretty uh, substantial problem as well. I kind of want to get into the title of the presentation and that is the conundrums of enforcement of illicit encampments. Um, and it's, it's a stunningly difficult process because with environmental degradation, anytime that we do enforcement of folks, say encampments along the Jordan River, we're addressing a difficult issue of the environmental problems caused by the encampments, but the negative impact that that has on the camper is also substantial. In fact, I have a policy that I won't allow my, my staff to address encampments where material may be removed, such as tents or those type of things during cold weather for obvious reasons. You also have the, the public health piece of this where there are encampments in, in uh, communities, in, in residential areas, in business areas, and the negative impact, the garbage and trash and human waste and syringes and all the things that we commonly see at these encampments. But then uh, when we do the enforcement, many times the success bar is so stunningly low because all we're doing is moving the problem around to another location. and. Uh, it's always been a big frustration of mine is that we are not having success or taking care of the problem. We're just kind of pivoting to different locations. And so do you address the public health issues or do you cause more negative impact for our unsheltered friends in the community? And that's always a difficult choice. And I would argue the biggest conundrum of uh, public health and enforcement piece of illicit encampments is the fact that I can't tell you the number of times that our staff have been asked by unsheltered individuals, where do you want me to go? And that is a, a pretty compelling question because many times don't have the answer, especially 
with issues that we have with uh, COVID right now, where our resource centers many times have been locked down because of problems with COVID or overcrowding, lack of beds. Uh, well, I know that we're having some uh, seasonal um, overflow shelters opening up this week and in the next couple of weeks in the valley. Many times there just aren't beds as well. So there are really, really no good answers in addressing this issue. We keep plugging away at it and partnering with a number of agencies. Over the last five years, we've pivoted our enforcement piece to this to include uh, numerous social service agencies. In fact, I'm astonished the years that we did enforcement that we didn't partner with these agencies because I can't imagine uh, not doing so now. So what I'd like to do is uh, go into a slide presentation and the first slide that, uh, that I have is, this is, we all remember Operation Rio Grande in late summer, the early fall of 2017, as you might appreciate, the health department had a major component in that, uh, a number of partnerships. I'm gonna show you a video. This was uh, Rio Grande, this is a video taken from a highway patrol uh, officer. This is actually not Rio Grande, but uh, 500 East, it's on the, excuse me, 500 West on the west side of building and it wasn't until uh, crime drug dealing and many things that just made this absolutely action needed to on this that the, the, the partnerships and local and state leaderships uh, public works and transportation dispatch highway 479 I'm going to just shut up 479 Take it you, uh, this is dispatch 510 1041. I'll be riding with 479 highway. Bail, it's a little bit difficult to hear you over the video, so you're aware. Okay, turn the sound up. Is that better? Yes, it was your voice that was hard to hear. Thank you so much. So here the officer is. Uh, Making a loop is maybe no on Fifth Western Island, and it actually is a city sanctioned park. And they're probably in the time. then block north and south, and two or three blocks east and west of this. So probably more people that would off and on this location. Just the crime. Catalyst kind of little tipping point where there was an enforcement piece to this. So, you know, the video kind of goes on, but I'm um, getting dizzy as well. So, we go to the next slide, and this is um, still slides of the same area, Rio Grande area in 2017. And uh, in addition to that, I want to just quickly take, if you would notice, the, the sign here. Before we take any enforcement action on illicit encampments, we always post the camps with a notice, uh, usually both in English and Spanish, advising uh, the illegal activity. We alert numerous social service agencies and uh, let them know when we're gonna be there. And our, and our primary focus is that we make sure that folks have an opportunity not to lose belongings that they, that they have. And while Legally, we don't have to post because it's illegal activity. We certainly think morally we need to, and if we're looking for long-term solutions, that's, that's certainly what we do. The commencement of the cleanup in 2017, as I had mentioned, there were numerous agencies. Here's some hard, heavy equipment from Salt Lake City. I believe the final tally on garbage and trash picked up was about uh, 300,000 pounds of garbage that was taken to the landfill and just a massive partnership effort. And, you know, I'm proud to say, and this is what it looked like late, uh, early fall of 2017. Things were clean. It looked great. Uh, we patted ourselves on the back that we did a good job. But in many aspects, all we did was uh, move the problem around. And uh, that has become a bit of a problem. And so, Last week, a week ago, yesterday, 
I went to the uh, Rio Grande area, and I'm sorry for the quality of some of these photographs, but they were taken from my, <clears throat> excuse me, from my car. And Rio Grande, Fifth West, uh, and this isn't for lack of effort from Salt Lake City or Salt Lake City PD or the health department. It's just such a tsunami type problem, and there are just so many individuals that the Rio Grande area looks every bit same as it did in 2017, which is stunningly unfortunate, but it's the nature of this crazy, crazy difficult problem that we have. Um, pretty much the same, uh, other than I don't think we have the criminal element that we had in 2017. So this is gonna be a focus for the health department and numerous problems, and as we speak, Salt Lake City is uh, doing outreach, social service, in these locations to see that we can offer any assistance possible before we uh, pivot to the enforcement piece uh, on the Rio Grande area. Secondary, now I've got three or four, maybe five videos that I wanna take and during this same time, in uh, fall of 2017 or, or late summer, we were receiving a lot of complaints about um, uh, camps and garbage and trash along the Jordan River. And as many of you know, in the central part of the valley on the Jordan River, ever looked at an aerial photograph, there's a large section of open space along the Jordan River. It runs from about 3,300 south to about 4,200 south. Uh, it's a beautiful area. And many years ago when the Little Dell Reservoir was put in, there was a swap off of uh, property and so wetlands that were uh, removed because of the reservoir uh, the county agreed to swap and keep this area pristine and clean and so the county county parks and recs are responsible for this but unfortunately that's not what has happened so here's a quick video this is just uh, standing on the back south. And uh, the garbage and trash. Let's go, you're by police. Things and, if you, you are know, in the uh, tent, come out. Photographs and my staff obviously are not great professional. You don't find police. I'm getting busy with this. If you're in a tent, come out. You get an idea. Uh, I think the uh, Unified PD is here on the value Camps ran from 33rd South on the 3rd South. The problem was totally massive. We also had a problem we can't get equipment of the geographic location of those. Help, we have a question from Pauline. Is there any way that you could mute the video because we can't hear you, but we can hear the video and it's, it's hard to hear what you're saying about the video. Thank you. Um, so difficult. We're done. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the heads up and the, and the, and the videos have been muted. Appreciate that, that information. So uh, uh, another uh, video. And entering mute that one as well. Entering camp two. It should have been muted. Okay. I'm I'm here in the video, so oh, wow. I'm assuming that's muted at your end. So this this is again on 39th South in the um, Mill Creek area. And the irony was for this location and for others, we reached out to our friends, uh, a Corps of Engineers in an attempt to clean this up and we were denied access with equipment, even though in some of these locations we couldn't uh, bring equipment in just because it just logistically was impossible to do uh, because they didn't want us to mess up the environmentally sensitive area, but clearly that had already occurred. The gentleman that you just saw a picture of was uh, one of our social service partners. We spent the better part of two weeks flooding these areas with social service outreach to make sure that everybody had an opportunity for a place to go. 
before we commence to clean up. And again, uh, numerous partners on the cleanup, Volunteers of America, wow. Red Cross, um, West Valley Public Works, South Salt Lake Public Works, PD agencies, and of course the Health Department. Another video and, uh, of different locations, and these are all within about, I think this is about a quarter of a mile away from the last one, but it was no more than just a train of just stunning environmental degradation and garbage and trash and uh, human waste and all the difficulties that we see with, um, with these illicit encampments. So here's our problem, you know, where do these people go once we, um, because many times we, these are individuals that are either have addictive issues or resource resistant and so success is such a stunningly low bar from an enforcement enforcement perspective because for the most part the vast majority of these individuals just moved uh, to another location and as pressure is put on at one location then we have uh, the same type of difficulties at other locations it's a problem that um, Maybe 20 years ago, we, we saw coming, but the last five or six years, we've almost seen the problem double every single year. And uh, we're in this awful position of attempting to do enforcement, but also do so with civility and try to partner with our uh, social service friends to find long-term solutions instead of just, you know, uh, moving the problem along and we're in areas fatigued. Uh, releasing some of that fatigue, but uh, eventually the, the problem returns to the same location. I'm gonna skip to, and I believe this is the last of the videos along the Jordan River. Extension of Camp 11, little to no access. And these videos that I'm showing you, this isn't the same location. This was within a stretch of about a mile and a half, and it was just camp after camp, I would argue maybe 60, 50 different camps uh, abandoned or otherwise with the associated garbage and trash. Still photographs uh, of the same type of problem. Many of you, if you uh, have crossed 39 South in the Jordan River, if you looked off to the left, you would see a pump house. Uh, off to the left, you were, if you were going west. And on, on the south side, just 50, 60 yards from the road. This is what the Jordan River uh, looked like, the bank of the Jordan River, stunning the amount of garbage and trash. You can see here and take note of the posting during the abatement process of, of these camps. We um, used inmates from the county jail, from the state prison, volunteers, a number of health department staff, public work staff, uh, staff from municipalities, because these were such difficult areas to get in and, and address the solid waste and garbage and trash that uh, literally, in some cases, material had to be put on tarps and then individuals would drag it out to a staging area where we could get equipment. Um, and this was done for a period of about two or three weeks. And this particular cleanup was uh, just stunning with the amount of, of waste. There were 420 tons of garbage was removed from the Jordan River uh, for those two, two and a half miles in the fall of 2017. And um, it was a stunning project and something that quite frankly we're pretty proud of all of the unsheltered individuals we reached out to social service agencies a few availed themselves to uh, resource assistance uh, the vast majority simply moved to another location here's a good example and i wish we had a better perspective of this particular slide but this is uh, again uh, close to 39 south and it looks like a big pile of garbage but that actually runs about maybe 150 yards and I think we took 10 or 11 dump trucks and this was all material in some cases that was drug on tarps as far as a uh, half a mile away. So the, the magnitude, the labor, the cost of this cleanup was just absolutely stunning and I would just sit there and I would think man if we would have taken better care of our unsheltered individuals uh, we would not have had to spend literally the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were spent in this cleanup in 2017. Interesting uh, uh, 
Um, there were a number of structures on the West Valley side of the river. Um, these are two separate structures that were actually buildings. The structure on the right, the individuals had built a little platform over the Jordan River and they actually had a, a, a toilet that, uh, that had no plumbing. And so when they would use the bathroom, they would simply uh, go in, uh, you know, drop into the Jordan River, which obviously has compelling environmental health concerns in itself. So these structures were torn down and, uh, and uh, cleaned up as well. On the uh, West Valley side, after we got permission from the Corps of Engineers, we were able to gain access with heavy equipment. And so the cleanup in South Salt Lake and West Valley was much easier because a lot of heavy equipment was used. But again, the total cleanup uh, for this entire project was uh, approaching a million pounds of uh, garbage and trash, solid waste and refuse. This is a very interesting photograph and uh, this was on the West Valley side and, and individuals had dug a, um, a, a tunnel, uh, an underground bunker, if you will. And I'm, I'm a geologist, by the way, and this is stunningly unsafe where this was dug on the bank of the Jordan River. And uh, the second the slide in the middle and on the right are actually photographs underground where these individuals had lived. And while well, just an amazing amount of work was done in doing this, it breaks one's heart to realize that in a location where we have so many assets and so many resources that we would have people have to resort to digging a hole and living in a ground uh, right next to uh, such an amazing community that we have. And so we uh, relocated these individuals, uh, we collapsed this uh, front end loaders and cleaned this up, but a stunning amount of work and very unfortunate from a social uh, perspective on, on this slide. The next couple of slides I'm probably most proud of as far as the efforts that the health department had on this. The pictures that you saw basically landfill like amounts of garbage and trash. Uh, this is what the locations look like and I will promise you that it looks the same today um, where we had uh, hundreds of tons of garbage. Now we, uh, we have what the Corps of Engineers wanted uh, many years ago when this was given to the county to take care of in lieu of the, the uh, Little Dell Reservoir property. And uh, it's amazing the difference and uh, with stunning partnerships and help. And our office regularly, I have a couple of part-time staff that have an ATV and they work this area with um, South Salt Lake, Mill Creek, West Valley police. and. If we have encampments, which happen, we get social service out to uh, work with the individuals, but we just don't allow it. And, and I would feel awful if we ever let this uh, become what it was before. Uh, pretty impressive, the work that was done, not, not so much by our office, but all of our many partners in cleaning this up. So here, that's the good news, here's the bad news. Last uh, Thursday, a week ago yesterday, I did a walkabout and I, specifically because complaints that we had had, uh, spent some time near the state health department. As many of you know, the Jordan River runs east and west behind the state health department building as well as the natural resource building. And so I uh, walked about a quarter, a half a mile on both sides of the river. And uh, we, we had received complaints on this, but uh, there were probably two dozen active camps uh, within a half a mile of the Jordan River. And, and oh, unfortunately, these camps and the debris and the garbage and trash look exactly like what we did have in the West Valley, South Jordan area. And so, you know, you put pressure or you address one area and you tend to have the same problems occur at other locations. Um, uh, more of the camps, this is on the on the north side of the river across from the state health department. You can see in the upper left, the uh, bank of the river. And I, I, I think it's really important that I tell you that we attempt to be so civil and gracious with these individuals because we understand they all have a story, they all have a problem, but we also have a job with the environmental degradation and, and many times the 
pull between the civility and the enforcement pieces is, is hard to grasp. But I do think there's a bit of an irony that we have, you know, just these camps and the awful garbage and trash. And uh, I'm not showing pictures of uh, human waste, which was uh, fairly common in these photographs as well. I stop at this one and I know it's shortly before lunch and I don't want to gross everybody out, but the upper left hand camp, when I walked up, uh, there was a gentleman who was defecating into the Jordan River, um, you know, kind of something that you can't unsee. And that's the kind of problems that we have. And again, I guess you could argue both as a public and an environmental health piece to our involvement with this difficult location. I specifically ask about the wheelchair, excuse me, that you see in the location because I certainly would like to know if we have somebody that has unique needs and I was advised that that's just something that they had found and were used uh, to transport material in and out of the camps along this area. So like the, uh, like other locations, we are now going to focus with our friends in Salt Lake City, our social service agencies, and this will be a priority here before the snow flies. I think I mentioned, and I will reiterate it again, that while there's no legal component for this, I have a policy that I will not allow my staff to take out a camp and potentially leave somebody with exposure issues once the weather turns cold, not a drop you know, dead date for that, but we know when it's too cold to be out enforcing and potentially making people move and or if they vacated to remove tents and blankets and those type of things. Uh, again, that's that conundrum balancing act that one has to take in addressing this very, very difficult issue. I'd like to uh, move quickly to what is arguably the biggest problem that I, I see as far as getting in the way of solutions for addressing these difficult issues, and that is resource resistant. This is a camp that you could all drive to. These, all of these photographs that I'm showing pretty much from here on were taken last week. And this is about 950 South, 450 West in Salt Lake City. And there's about 30 people that are living in a camp, the garbage, you get close to this and you can smell the uh, urine odor is just absolutely awful. Uh, we've had social service people out there now for, for almost three weeks and, and quite frankly, people are reluctant to, to receive assistance. I'm a bit of a softy and, uh, and I only say this to offset what I'm gonna say in a slide here down the road that when I was there a week ago Thursday, uh, it was early in the morning and I went to McDonald's and bought a couple of bags of the dollar breakfast sandwiches and disseminated and chatted with our unsheltered friends. Uh, for the most part, these folks just want to be left alone. But this is going to be a camp that is going to need to be addressed uh, before uh, the winter flies and, and we are partnering with Salt Lake City to uh, address kind of an enforcement piece of this once we've exhausted all social service efforts which are occurring right now to get these people into housing and to shelters into overflow shelters or whatever assistance that they might need. This is arguably the highest profile problem that we're dealing with anywhere in the valley right now and this is around the 7th South 7th East, between about 400 uh, East to 200 East, there are a number of, of encampments. Many of these uh, camps are on the parking strip right in front of somebody's house, uh, in front of Topher Park, a number of locations. I wouldn't dare guess a number of individuals that we have living there, but and again, it's this conundrum, how much do we push on this problem because these folks are for the most part gracious, they're kind, they'll talk to us, they just want to be left alone, but rarely does the week go by that I don't get a phone call from a resident that is absolutely many times in tears because the quality of life of their business, of their of their home, whatever is is being so negatively affected by garbage and trash and human waste and all the other difficulties that come with uh, illicit encampments in the city. 
So this is a project that we're partnering with, with uh, Salt Lake City and other agencies to address in the near future. But right now it's being flooded with social service and other outreach attempts uh, just to exhaust all efforts before we uh, use the regulatory card. Other uh, photographs in the same general 8th South, 7th South location. And if one were to take a drive there today, I think you would be astonished at the difficulties that our unsheltered problems have, have caused in uh, Central City. Oh, I'm somewhat reluctant on how much I want to get into this, but I, but I think I, I owe it uh, to, to let you know. Thank you, Paton that we have a kind of a new issue that has uh, shown up particularly in Salt Lake City but even in other cities and that is third-party agitators and many times um, when we show up after we have posted properties there are a number of different groups and I'm not going to say the name of their group to give them a little more information which is what they desire but I've been working at the health department for 30 years and I'm not sure that I've ever dealt with such lack of civility and decorum and just meanness to the point of evilness that we have. Uh, last Thursday, I, I stopped uh, with my personal car because I just want to get a couple of photographs for this presentation as well as to share with Salt Lake City on how our outreach for social service is doing on the 7th South location and I got about 50 feet from my car and was immediately encircled by these individuals. The uh, woman in front of me, uh, she has kind of been self-appointed as my personal agitator and I've had multiple times when she, without a mask on, has been in my face screaming on, you know, just how stunningly awful we are. And quite frankly, all we want to do is force the regulations clean up the garbage and do it in a civil way and be as kind to our unsheltered uh, populations as we can. These folks have pretty much embedded themselves in the encampments, but I will tell you they have very little um, interest in the well-being of the unsheltered population. Last, last December, uh, we had a gentleman, we were doing working with Salt Lake City on a cleanup near Library Square, who we noticed was unconscious uh, when we showed up for the encamp and they, as they were screaming at us and just the most vile, vulgar uh, responses, they were stepping over this individual that was unconscious, which my staff noticed immediately called 911. And he was probably, according to the University Hospital, maybe 30 minutes away from dying of exposure. And uh, they, and unfortunately, I have a policy, well, I'm not gonna say unfortunately it is what it is, that we don't take any regulatory action and without posting and giving people all the effort in the world to collect belongings and move on. That's also the notification piece for these folks and so they will uh, they will show up. The, the hands that you see in the top were a gentleman who uh, was trying to grab my phone away from me and doing the kind of the chest bump, denying you from giving locations. And so there's a whole new piece to uh, the regulatory enforcement of what we do. And I would argue um, safety has, uh, has certainly become one of those. And just we have such amazing, wonderful partners in Salt Lake City PD and other public safety agencies. And this is just a new, uh, new wrinkle to the regulatory uh, piece to this. I'm going to get a little bit personal on this and I uh, hate to do this, but I don't know if one of the interactions with these individuals, uh, my mother passed away. She had uh, knee surgery and unfortunately fell and got an infection. So I sat at her bedside for about three weeks until she died. And uh, these individuals, um, have used that on me and, you know, that got on video, your F and B word mother, I bet, you know, that dad is, is really proud of you type stuff. And I, and I, and I say that because seriously, the most vulgar um, agitating stuff that I, I probably ever dealt with in my career. And so 
as a part of the enforcement piece to this, we certainly need to make sure that these are done safely before somebody gets hurt. And uh, unfortunately, with this third party agitation piece and agitation piece in place, uh, we, that's certainly a, a likely possibility unless we're stunningly cautious, which are just absolutely amazing partners in Salt Lake City Mayor's Office and Salt Lake City PD are partnering to see that that doesn't happen. So uh, probably spent more time on that than I wanted, but I will kind of follow that up with, we had a cleanup scheduled, not to remove any camps or do anything, but just clean up the garbage from the videos or from the photographs that you saw along the Jordan River near the State Health Department and also on North Temple and so on. Public media, media uh, this I think Tuesday or Wednesday was there with you know, my picture on it of this awful criminal that I am. And so we canceled the cleanup and uh, you know it's unfortunate because our cleanup was to clean up needles and garbage and trash and try to address issues on, on the uh, Jordan River but there are some limitations within Salt Lake City PD right now as, as far as support for this particular day. So we just canceled the cleanup rather than uh, have the potential safety issue and just the absolute uncivil silliness uh, that uh, we have to deal with now in Salt Lake City. There's also a, another component that is really crazy and I think unique to our COVID situation and that is we're seeing all over the valley and this certainly is not limited to Salt Lake City encampments that are not your more empirical uh, fire and tent type thing but people living in broken down RVs and broken down trailers and we're seeing this all over the valley this is uh, on the north side of the interstate, uh, kind of by back behind um, the Red Iguana restaurant. Uh, seven or eight camps, all of these uh, RVs are inoperable. And then you obviously have the garbage and the trash and the issues that one would normally have with a normal encampment. I think it's important to understand that as a health department, we're not a zoning issue. And so quite frankly, while the optics aren't so great, we don't really care about an RV parked along the side of the street. But once you start having discharge of sewage, uh, garbage, those type of things, which we tend to see almost all the time now at these locations, uh, then the health department gets involved in these. This is the last video that I'm gonna put you through. And this is a police officer about three weeks ago referred us to these similar type camps in Salt Lake City on the west side of Salt Lake City. And we are working on, I looked on our database and I think we've got seven, maybe eight similar encampments that are not encamp, excuse me, encampments per se, but these um, RV uh, impromptu type camps with the garbage and trash and uh, the type of things that we have. And, and, and I will tell you that this is new to us and something that I would argue has a, a big connection to COVID and the difficulties in the economy related to COVID. And for the most part, we're kind of leaving these alone unless there is a real compelling public health or environmental health issue. But we have cases like this from South Jordan all the way to Salt Lake City in the Valley of these uh, strange uh, broken down RV type encampments. Oops. Um, third, I'm not gonna show you before and after because I'm already boring myself with the before and after things, but I will tell you that in, in the fall of, or summer of 2018, we did a massive uh, cleanup in the Victory Road area, and that's the road if you came down from the Capitol heading toward Davis County, the hill there is owned by Salt Lake City. And uh, we did a cleanup in 2018 that had uh, about 450 tons of refuse were removed off of the hill. And again, stunningly difficult because of the uh, accessibility or lack thereof uh, to these encampments. Um, we used heavy equipment and, it, and things looked great. This was just two, uh, two years ago. 
I had staff go up there because we've been getting complaints about uh, garbage and trash and encampments there. And uh, crazy thing is, it almost looks as bad as it did two years ago with uh, the trash and uh, just the, the normal things that we see with illicit encampments. So I guess my, my point is, and probably not well taken, is that we're working really, really hard, but it seems like we're kind of spinning our wheels and even in many ways uh, just not making progress on these problems. And there just has to be this amazing partnership, the regulatory piece, the social service piece, the uh, resource piece, and uh, and even with all of those assets being used, not, not, not so much. We continue to see the same problems at the same locations after great expense and effort to address the, the locations. There's an interesting one I wanted to pivot to the, the public health or maybe the disease piece. This is a picture of a gentleman at Rio Grande with a uh, self-made uh, restaurant and he, for three dollars, you get a hot dog or a piece of chicken, and below him, unrefrigerated, are two large vats. Uh, I think one was potato salad, and the other was coleslaw, unrefrigerated. Uh, um, and when the hepatitis A in our valley, uh, we kind of thought that was going to be our big disease issue, right? And clearly, we were wrong there. But we tracked the. Uh, the strain of that hepatitis B uh, directly back to unsheltered individuals that came to our community from the unsheltered communities in San Diego and in Southern California. And one could easily argue that the hepatitis A crisis that for all intents and purposes uh, three years ago paralyzed uh, our, our agency would not have happened without the uh, unsheltered population that um, you know, doing what they can just to survive and get along. Um, the one thing again that I haven't shown a whole lot of, and that is every one of these locations and all of these cleanups have massive amounts of human, human waste. And uh, we will take and bucket that up, treat it as special waste. And in some cases we've taken two and three pickup loads of these five gallon buckets to the landfill and then had it disposed as special waste. The syringe problem is not as bad as it used to be because of the kiosks that we partnered as a county and as Salt Lake City, but we still see a lot of syringes. In the last five years, uh, I've had three staff that have had unfortunate needle sticks in uh, some type of a cleanup regulatory action. And I will tell you that we have extremely stringent policy safety protocols on uh, picking up syringes. Uh, in one case, three syringes were poked uh, with the needle up with a blanket sitting on the ground. And when they went to pick the blanket up, they were stuck by the syringes and very, very unfortunate event. And so we are stunningly cautious and we'll, whether it's um, partners that we work with, uh, inmates or other agencies. We just have no hand contact anymore because of the difficulties that we've had in, in the past with needle sticks. And so with that, I'm going to end the presentation and um, I want to talk a little bit about COVID. I have a number of hats that I'm wearing right now. One is that I'm on the county's uh, incident command on COVID, and one of those responsibilities has been assisting to put together quarantine and isolation facilities. And these have been specifically for our unsheltered friends that maybe have been exposed to COVID, have uh, actually are ill, uh, waiting for testing. And, and what the goal was, and we started this back in March, was to have a location where people could safely um, either get well or go over their quarantine time. We provide food, we have staffed these facilities, and uh, over the last several months, there's been a lot of media inquiries, uh, where they're at, kind of not in my backyard type thing. Uh, we've been open, but not given the farm away to what we're doing just because we didn't want to have any undue 
oversight of ill people simply trying to get better and we still continue to run uh, those facilities and take care of our unsheltered population it's very important to us those facilities are also open to individuals that uh, just don't have a place to go maybe a family has uh, a grandmother or something as part of the family and they need self-isolation if somebody's sick in the family we are more than willing to have those uh, quarantine and isolation facilities open for those uh, those opportunities as well. And uh, with um, difficulties with COVID in our resource center, many of you probably know that we've had problems at virtually all of the resource centers at one time or the other of COVID and having to uh, isolate and close those down. And that's obviously exacerbated the problem of the camping and the housing and, or the illegal camping and, and those type of things. Um, but uh, it uh, has enhanced the difficulty of dealing with this extremely difficult problem. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm saying I've got 45 minutes and I kind of wanted to leave time if there were any questions. I guess the, the real important thing that I want to leave with this group is that we are the enforcement arm and are happy. our unsheltered friends in our community and assisting us with the abatement uh, piece of the encampments. So are there any questions or uh, any, any other directions that one might want me to take this uh, information? Just as a reminder for attendees, if you'd like to ask a question, um, use the raise hand feature. If you hover over the screen, you should see it at the bottom and I will allow you to unmute. We have a question from N. Kessel. Lynn, I'm not, I'm not seeing the question. Uh, N. Kessel, go ahead. You are unmuted. Oh, I think I unmuted them, or I muted them again. I'm sorry. <laughs> can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. That was actually my fault. Um, no, I know there's been talk about, about maybe setting up camp encampments or places where you could put in toilet facilities and that sort of thing. Do you think that would be helpful? And is it something that the county or somebody else is looking at? That's such a great question. Thank you so much. And um, yes, it is. And there's not a consensus on the value of doing that. Um, that's been tried in with different levels of success in other communities. Um, kind of on a mini scale, we're, we, we're having a real problem with um, folks uh, around the, the bees ballpark, which is the, the uh, parking lot just to the north of the bees is a city owned property. And there's a lot of unsheltered individuals that are hanging out there. There's a lot of unfortunate drug use in that area as well. And so a porta party was actually put in that parking lot earlier this summer, but it was something that quite frankly, I didn't support because I knew that it would be a bit of an attractive nuisance. And then you know, but I, I kind of can't argue both sides of the argument here because it also makes a concern too if you don't have a place for individuals to use the bathroom. Then you have the other difficult issues. Um, that was removed because once the porta potty was there, um, it greatly increased the number of individuals that uh, hung out in that area. But many years ago, I had gone to a national conference and came back and spoke to uh, the director of the health department and 
suggested an actual location uh, that would be terrific to set up not not just porta potties but showers and have uh, you know some pretty basic rules to camp here have uh, waste pickup and those type of things and this was uh, again about maybe 10 years ago the problem wasn't at the crisis that it is now and so reached out to several city leaders and state leaders and it kind of didn't get any traction um, that is now being considered it's certainly something that i support uh, but when you do that you're going to have to figure out a location that's not going to have a negative impact to business and to residents and there are not too many of those locations that doesn't have a a big environmental health impact i can think of a couple locations where i would suggest i I believe the official stance, and I do not want to speak for our friends in Salt Lake City, but I believe the mayor's office is looking for more viable options such as uh, housing and those type of things and maybe not real supportive of that right now. And we're their health department, so we certainly support their position. But it's something that has been considered and I think in other communities outside of Salt Lake City is being seriously considered. No, I think it's I think it's a viable option because as I attempted to articulate earlier, one of the more difficult, frustrating things for me as the bureau director, environmental health bureau director, is dealing with these issues. Uh, if I was on the other side of the issue, the problem, yeah, where do you go? Um, and particularly if for whatever your reason is that you refuse to go to one of the resource centers, there just aren't too many options. Great question, and it's something that is being evaluated. Thank you, and thanks for your uh, your work on this. I know it's not an easy thing. Thank you so much. Next, we have Pauline. Go ahead, Pauline. Have, yeah, hi. I just have a question. Has anybody ever tried, and I don't know how this would work, some kind of an incentive program for people who are in encampments, you know, whereby if you could financially incentivize them to keep an area clean say you know if you if we come by everybody in a tent gets you know 25 dollars you know at the end of a week or end of a day if we come back and we have given you a dumpster and you clean up the area just to see if people would be willing to actually maintain these sites without this high level of awful, you know, discarding of objects, blankets, you know, food, whatever. Um, has there any been any kind of pilot that you've thought of where you could actually incentivize the people that are living there to keep a place reasonable, um, you know, some kind of financial incentive for individuals? I mean, it costs so much to clean up an area if there was a financial way to incentivize people to not make it a mess. I, I don't know. I, I you know, was just thinking. <laughs> a, again, another terrific question. And, and, and I think that's probably where the real solutions to this problem will be is thinking outside the box. Um, I, I'm probably not the real expert to answer that because I'm the enforcement piece of this as, as opposed to the social service or outreach piece, but there are a lot of those efforts in place right now. There are vouchers for hotel rooms, um, uh, lots of outreach uh, from different partners. Um, and, and Pauline, I, I think it's important that you understand, which I believe you probably do, that all camps are not equal. We, We'll go to some camps and we'll say, okay, other than this is against regulation number seven, what's the public health issue here? Because it's clean and tidy and you know, kind of looks like a KOA campground location. And for the most part, we're somewhat reluctant to address those because we have that massive question of where are they going to go? So I know that there are um, decision makers that are listening on this call and I have been regular meetings with them and so I, I will pass along that information. I think it's important to, to understand though that 
as difficult as it is, my responsibility on this is pretty black and white, and that is that there is a very, very specific uh, regulatory prohibition uh, that the Board of Health has set against camping except for in designated locations. That's pretty much what the regulation says, and so I kind of can't ignore that, but there certainly is some flexibility on, you know, choosing to address clean camps versus the other, and uh, so uh, I'm, I will pass along your information. But the bottom line is this, we, I probably am not doing, I have the authority just given the responsibility that I have that I can't ignore the regulation and even incentivize people having clean camps because in reality our regulation would prohibit that. But what I would love to see was a process where we had potential for clean camps in a designated area. And maybe that's a ways off before we see that come to uh, fruition. Thank you, great question. Thank you. Next we have Sarah and we have five minutes remaining. Thank you, Sarah, thank you. Hey. Hi there. Sorry, I disabled the wrong person. Go ahead, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello. Okay, rad. Um, so this might be redundant, um, but I've been in communication with the Public Parks Administration to reopen some of the public restrooms because they are functional restrooms that are locked up. And I can understand and hear that it's due to drug use and needles and keeping things clean. But I, I'm kind of feeling like, why should we have these porta johns? around if there are perfectly fine public restrooms. Uh, when I talked with them, they said that you have to like have an appointment to open them up, but it just feels like this is cascading into a more and more ridiculous conversation of why do we even have public restrooms in the first place? Like I get around on bicycle and if I have to use the restroom during a pandemic, I don't feel like it's ethically appropriate for me to just walk into a restaurant and ask to use the restroom also most of the time because they won't let me um, right, without right. being a customer. So yeah, I was just curious if y'all have like been in communication with um, Parks and Rec to see if there's something to work out or like create hand washing statements close, not statements, <laughs> hand washing <laughs> statements close no, to you. It makes a statement yeah. to wash your hands, right? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that has been a discussion as well, and there are a number of logistical variables, and one is that um, most of the outside uh, park bathrooms, the plum bathrooms, uh, have issues with uh, freezing pipes just because they, you know, so there are some logistical things that I think probably could uh, be overcome, but no, I, I get it. Um, I'm out and about all the time, and we have a clinic at 610 South, 200 East, and I've had to have my badge set so I could open get into that building because things are tight because of COVID uh, when I need to use the restroom and I'm downtown because you know, like you've mentioned, there's just not too many locations. And so uh, I, it, it's, it's something that I know Salt Lake City Parks and Recs have, uh, have been way more open to and, and the fact of the porta potty that I mentioned earlier, and it's not the only one that has been set out to try to address this issue. Uh, so. It's, it's something that certainly is being entertained right now. There are logistical uh, issues to overcome, but I think our friends and so, and, and I can't speak for them. I mean, it's their decision, not ours. Our only focus would be if it's open and needs to be clean and safe. Um, but no, yeah, great question. And, and, and you're right, it's, it's just more difficult to find a place if you're unsheltered to use the bathroom, particularly during the winter. And uh, I, I, I think it's also important that uh, the other side of this, uh, the, the awful comment that I made about the gentleman defecating in the Jordan River, there were two parks with bathrooms open within 200 yards of where this occurred. So there kind of needs to be give and take on both sides of this debate. Thank you, sir. Great question. We don't have any more questions or raised hands. We have two minutes remaining. Um, if uh, there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you. This was really enlightening for me. Oh, we do have one more raised hand. Yeah, 
Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Okay, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me on my camera. I um, totally can. Hi, Dale. I just wanted to ask another question uh, to follow up on what Sarah said, but I just wanted to ask what the process would look like for getting a biohazard bin to dispose of needles if there's in public places or if there's um, anything that we can do to push um, the city to get more trash cans out in these areas um, so people can dispose of these things so that it's not um, a public hazard, if that's <laughs> the main concern. Yeah, yeah, I know time's short, so I, I'm going to really rush an answer on this. Uh, the first is that there are, I believe, four Sharps kiosks that we have a contract with Salt Lake City, and I'm talking the health department, and there is a fifth one they're deciding where to locate, and the health department services those, and by that I mean we empty them, we properly dispose of the syringes and those materials, and they attempt to locate those where they think they're of most value. And I will tell you that I'm on calls weekly with our partners in Salt Lake City. And if there's a location where they need dumpsters, uh, you know, the, the, the black roll-off cans or, you know, I, I'm making, I'm not sure what color Salt Lake Cities are, but they will put them there, including the 7th South location where I uh, had difficulties here last week. There are a number of dumpsters in that location, and the city is more than willing to do that uh, to attempt to reduce the garbage and trash and the kiosk thing stunningly successful and I had made the comment that we don't have the sharps problem we used to that is directly related to the fact that we have these uh, sharps kiosks as well as a number of agencies are focusing on uh, on picking up and cleaning up sharps that are not health department related great question crazy important You're at 12.20. Okay, thank you. So are we done? It looks like we have one more hand raised. I We can take that question from Preston if you'd like. I, I, I would love it. Preston, go ahead, please. Uh, no question, Dell. I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of everyone. Um, I had a chance to work with Dell on Incident Command, and he has worked tirelessly for many, many months. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Thank you, Dale. It's been a wonderful uh, presentation, and, we, and the information has been amazing um, and uh, very informative. I, this is a topic I had no idea. I just been sitting here kind of shaking my head and not knowing what to say. Um, but we'd like to thank all attendees for uh, coming today's, to today's presentation. And this webinar will close in five seconds. Thank you again. Thank you so much for your time.